Sure. Ready? Yeah. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, hope you had a good lunch. Uh, this is Introduction to SC Linux. I'm Jason. Uh, the slides will be on my blog later. I'll put them up. Uh, so first, a few questions. Who knows that they use SC Linux? Like, one, okay. Who uses Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, any of those? All right, so you all actually use it too. Uh, who's turned it off on their machine? Oh. <laughs> That's why I didn't uh, I know he tries not to turn it off. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. That's good. So uh, quick overview about me. Uh, quick intro to SC Linux, what it is. And then I'll go through a few examples of why it breaks things and how to fix them. and like. A little bit of an intro to like what a policy looks like. It's far from a complete one, but it's enough to like maybe make you not scared of it. <laughs> uh, so I am a Gentoo developer. I maintain SC Linux, and I'm on the hardened project. My email, my PGP key, uh, my blog. I'll put the slides up later, as I said. Uh, all right, SC Linux. The S and the E mean secured and enhanced. If you didn't know that, I'm not sure why you're here. <laughs> um, security, obviously, it gives security stuff to the kernel and to everything on the computer. Enhanced is kind of the important part because it doesn't actually replace anything else. It extends it. So all your regular things continue to work. SC Linux is just one more layer on top. Um, so, yeah, it controls access. It's an access control method. It's what we call a mandatory access control method. And I'll get into that next. Uh, it has a whole bunch of things. It's very, very flexible. SC Linux itself doesn't actually mandate very much. Everything in it is in the policy. So. Android also uses IC Linux, but their policy is very, very different from like Fedora and Gen2 and stuff. But like, so like IC Linux is very flexible how it works. Uh, a bit of history. Originally made by the NSA, they based it off of uh, Bella Paluda, uh, if I pronounced that right, security thing. Uh, Released open source, added to the kernel. It was one of the first Mac in the kernel. Uh, it's used quite a lot. Gen 2, Red Hat, Fedora. It's optional in Debian and Ubuntu. Um, Android, every single Android phone for the last many years uses it, and it's on and enforcing in all of them. So that's pretty cool. So to explain a bit about Mandatory access control, I personally explained DAC, which is discretionary access control. These are the regular Unix permissions you're used to, users, groups, um, regular Unix permissions, and ACLs, and all those. Um, the discretion basically means that the user can choose to do what they want with their own stuff. So if I have a bunch of data that is important, and I am either malicious, I can make it readable so other people can get it. Or if I'm just an idiot, I can make it readable by accident, and then other people can get it, both of which are bad. And root in a regular system can do basically anything it wants. There's nothing stopping root at all. And like this has some obvious problems, where like if you try to do things Linux is well known for like letting you do things like RMRF your entire partition. So yeah, root can usually do a lot. Um, 
in a mandatory access control, there is a system-wide policy that is, well, it's usually made by the distro, but as an administrator, you can modify it, extend it, or whatever you want. And it is fixed. So even if your DAC permissions allow things, SC Linux will not. So Linux will actually check the Unix permissions first. So if your permission on a file does not allow world readable, it won't let it at all. If you do make it world readable, it'll try that. Oh, OK, that's fine. Then it'll go on to SC Linux and say, oh, no, that one's not OK. Then it'll still block it. So it's one more step. There are uh, hooks all throughout the kernel. And it's called the uh, LSM, Linux Security Module. So there are many other kinds of Macs as well that use these hooks throughout the kernel and decide what to do with them. So there are fairly specialized ones like Yama. It only does a couple things, but it, they're sort of very important. And it doesn't really have a policy. SC Linux, AppArmor, Smack are big and have policies. AppArmor is the one that Ubuntu makes, and I think that one comes on Ubuntu machines by default, at least the servers. Uh, Smack is used by Samsung's Tizen, I think. SC Linux is used Red Hat, CentOS, and those family of things. Uh, used in Android as well, and it's fairly, I think it's the biggest of all of them. I'm not really sure. So. This is the part where all you sinners changed. If you change this slide to permissive, um, well, there's basically three states. Off, which is useless, don't do that. Uh, permissive, which will tell you all the problems that it would have stopped, but it won't actually do anything about it, which is also pretty useless. And then enforcing is the actual like one you want. So try not to turn that off. And there are different kinds of policies. Uh, targeted is what Fedora runs in by default, I believe. It means that the servers and like Apache and those kind of things are locked down pretty hard, but your main like user account is fairly unconfined. It can do quite a lot, uh, which is a pretty good trade-off because they do run it by default. So you have users that don't really opt into it, so it has to work for them. Um, Strict doesn't have unconfined, so even a regular user has restrictions, but it's still pretty okay. MLS is the serious business one. If you are a three-letter government agency, it doesn't work very well. It's like a real pain in the ass to use. Uh, if you want to do graphical stuff with it, it kind of sucks. <laughs> um, MCS is great. That's what I use. It's basically strict plus categories, which allow extra confinement for things like if you have many VMs, it can separate the individual VMs from each other. So they cannot touch each other and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not going to get into anything except strict in this talk. So these are from the SC Linux coloring book by Dan and Marin. It's awesome. You should download it and color it. I give the link later. Um, basically, this is what SC Linux rules look like. Everything is denied by default. And then you have a source, a target, a class, and a bunch of permissions you can do to it. So you allow the cat to eat food that is like the cat food. And you allow the dog to eat food that's the dog food. And that makes sense. And everything else is denied by default. So if the dog tries to eat the cat food, the kernel says no, and pulls the leash. And similarly, if the cat tries to eat the dog food, you don't get anything either. And the penguin gets really angry at you. <laughs> yeah, the, the color boot's awesome. You should totally do it. Um, so the SC Linux doesn't really sort of understand things, it only understands labels, and everything has a label. And if you have problems in SC Linux, it's almost always a labeling problem. It's sometimes like you need to add more rules, but 
if you try and customize things, it's almost always a labeling problem. So this is sort of the most important part to get. Labels have this format. Well, there's a user part, a role part, and a type. And then this sensitivity at the end is for MLS and MCS, which I'm not going to get into. Um, so here are some kind of labels. The first one is what the web server runs under. So by convention, we put underscore u, underscore r, and underscore t at the end. It's not actually required, but we just do anyway. Uh, so that's a HTTPD type, and it's a system role and user, so it's a daemon. The next one is what like a regular normal user runs under. And you'll notice that the user part is different. So there are extra constraints and things which you can look up later, which basically use the other parts of it to stop what they can do. So like a user role is not allowed to run the HTTP daemon. So even if a user try, they wouldn't actually like it wouldn't work. Uh, the next one is staff, which is regular staff, like staff u, staff r, staff t, is basically the same thing as user, but they are made for the administrators, and it allows you to also switch to the system administrator role, which has a lot of permissions. So uh, apart from sysadmin, staff and user are pretty similar. Then files also have labels, just like processes, just like everything else. Files have an object R role, because they're not like a user. And bin T is everything inside bin. Everything inside user, like slash US R is user T. And like it's once you get used to it, it's kind of obvious where things go based on their name. Um, and then there's the last one is HTTPD system content, which is content for the web server that's system-wide, like in slash var slash www. Then there's also like a system or HTTP user content, which is the stuff in like your home directory public HTML. Uh, yeah, so SLX is pretty early. So somehow they claim dash Z on everything, which is awesome. So ls dash Z will list the, the types on files, and it looks like that. They're pretty obvious. Bin is bin, dev is device, slash etc is etc. Like, it's kind of obvious. Um, PSZ will list the thing, the type things are running as. ID dash Z will list what you are running as. Uh, so that's how you find out what things are in. So if, for example, you got a new version of a program and it didn't work, and you looked at it and you said, oh, Apache is running as something that's not HTTPDT. Then something's probably wrong. You might need to change the labels on something to make it like use the new one you have or something like that. But so if you go PS and see what it is, it's like how you find things. So sometimes SLinux break things, and that's supposed to happen. <laughs> If you see something like this, where you have the audit logs, and you see that someone's trying to access shadow T, that's probably bad. Things don't usually read that. That might mean you've been hacked. It might be something really bad, but it's like not good. Um, the audit logs are actually not really part of SC Linux. They are part of the auditing subsystem within the Linux kernel, which is completely separate, and you can audit a lot of accesses to different things all around the machine. And SC Linux will also report its issues to audit. So yeah, that's where they go. If you don't have audit running, which you should because it's much better, then they go into dmessage, which they get this line, but you don't get the other like path information. So run audit. Um, Yeah, so usually, as a regular user, you don't have to write policy. Like, the aim of all distros is to make things work. 
And if you have something in a weird place, you want it to have reasonable defaults, but sometimes users want to do other things. So you can have websites in users' home directories. And maybe people don't always want that, and maybe they sometimes do, but you don't want them to write rules for it. So there's a Boolean, which means there are extra rules which you can turn on and off in the policy just by running, like turning on and off. So let's say you go and you turn on user dears in Apache. You make your website and it doesn't work. Awesome. Why? Oh, okay. I screwed up the permissions on the directory so Apache couldn't access it. Okay, so you chmod it and now Apache should be able to read it, but oh, okay, it still can't do it. Now, if you check the audit logs, you'll see that HTTPD is trying to access like, the user directories. And audit to allow will, it's a tool I'll show you later, which will take all the audit entries and show you what the rules would be. And it will also let you know, oh, this thing can be changed by tunable. So if you turn on the HTTPD enable home dears, it allows HTTPD to access home dears, which does what it sounds like, and it's awesome, and it works. So fixing problems is not that hard. Usually you just have to poke around a little bit, and you'll get it working. Um, all right, uh, any questions at this point before I go more? None? OK, cool. Uh, all right, so the labels on disk have um, like, we have a big file with all the F contexts, and it uses these regexes to match what the label should be, and then labels the entire system. So you can have a straight up, like a simple one, user bin Apache, and it will label it as HTTPD exec T, which is the type for the ex executable. Uh, the dash dash means it's only allowed for regular file types. So if you somehow like change Apache from being the Apache binary to assembling to something else, like something really bad, because of this dash dash, it wouldn't allow assembling to be labeled like that. So that works. And they are full regexes, like full, full ones. So the second, like this will match HTTPD, the directory, and will also match everything under it because of the dot star. And then also the like Apache and then Apache 2, and they're labeled in different directories. So the 2 is sometimes optional, depending on what distro you're on. So the 2 has a question mark, so it can match both with and without it. Uh, so usually we have a lot of types, but they kind of follow the same pattern. So these are the ones, like these are the most obvious ones for HTTPD. If you were running FTPD or something else, there'd be a bunch of similar types. There'll be a type of the executable, there'll be something for the config, there'll be something for the log, and maybe it's data, depending on what the thing is. Um, and the last one is a really big regex, allowing people to put things in their home directory under public HTML, which is the standard, or web, or dub, 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 and they'll all get the same label. And the home beer at the beginning is special. It, when it goes through this, uh, gen home beer con gets run automatically, which will take all these kind of entries and make new versions for every single user on your system. Um, so, like home is not a directory. So this gets replaced with all your users, like slash home, slash Jason, slash home, slash Bob, whatever. And then it, you get one for all your users. And it changes the type. So maybe if some of them are user U, it'll replace the system with user and then stuff like that. There are a bunch more I added a while ago. So you can do all kinds of cool matching now. Uh, and this is kind of what a policy looks like. You don't really need to know it. You just need to like understand why or how things can be done. It's like, like the earlier cat and dog, there's a allow the HTTP daemon to search and read and open things inside the config directories and the files. 
that kind of makes sense. But that's really long-winded to write, so that sucks. So we have a bunch of macros inside it. So you'll see things like list dear perms, which actually expands to basically get at or search, read, open. Because typically, if you want to list a directory, you need all of them. So the macro will expand to all of that. And read file perms, read link file perms. So there's a bunch of macros we use to simplify things. And then that still kind of sucks. So we have even more macros to manage files pattern is this line basically expands to this block. So you don't have to do all the writing. You can write just one, and it handles it for you. And then it also does network stuff. So you can allow sockets, TCP sockets in this case. So if you wanted to bind to a UDP socket, it wouldn't work, like given given access. And it can bind to HTTPD port T, which if you look somewhere else inside it, you'll see is port 80 or 8080. If you want to bind your web server to port 123, that won't work. You would either have to add the HTTPD port type and add 123 to that, or you could find whatever type is on port 123 and add, like allow Apache to bind to that type instead. So either one works and whatever is easier for you, or just keep it on port 80, because that's what you use. <laughs> Um, more troubleshooting. Yeah, so as earlier, we try to make the defaults reasonable and cover all the weird cases. Like that's why the regexes are really useful because if you put things in different directories, the regexes will usually handle it. But sometimes people really want to put things in really strange places. So if you really want to put your website in slash website instead of like bar dub dub dub, you can do that, and it's probably not going to work at first. And then if you ls it with dash z, you'll see the types are wrong. And OK, well, that's pretty obvious. Because default t shouldn't really have access to anything, because it's not really a thing. Um, so you can add your own file type regexes to the system using se manage. Um, so in this case, very similar to this part, where you have, this is the file context for the main system content. You can add your own one here, and you add the type with that regex, and then it'll know everything under there should be matched like that. Then you can restore con, which, like, that's the tool which will go through everything and check the contexts. If they're wrong, it'll change them to match what they should be. There's also a dash force flag, which will really change things. You shouldn't need to use it. Um, if things really don't work, then you can try it. And after you do that, it'll work again. And that's awesome. Uh, oh, I didn't actually cover this. Set enforce one. For those of you that have used Fedora and stuff, that's the command to turn it on from permissive into enforcing. And set enforce zero is what you should never do. Set enforce zero turns it from enforcing into permissive. So that is good. And these shirts also came from Dan Walsh. Make <laughs> Linux enforcing again. So uh, yeah, do that, because that's awesome. If you want to learn some more, there's a bunch of places. I'll put the slides up. The coloring book's awesome. There's a lot of stuff on the wikis about them. This is really long and has a lot of detail about all of it. There's a lot more rules for different things, different kinds of rules. There's other kinds of classes. You can do all kinds of networking stuff, which it can get pretty in depth, but you, like this isn't just an intro. So um, I have a demo of some stuff too, but any questions first? about anything? No? All right. So the demo is uh, I have a VM running in enforcing mode. So you get enforce. Well, why is it off the screen? Oh, no. Is that on the screen? Close enough.
All right, can you tell it? Cool. All right, so get enforce. It says enforcing. Awesome, we're in the right mode. There's also SE status, which will tell you a lot more about it. Status enabled, good. This is the point, you can kind of ignore that. The policy type was the earlier things I mentioned. So this is running in strict mode. It's all running and MLS is not enabled. Um, uh, this is the file I mentioned earlier. That's what you want. And then um, if we go PS AUX set. Uh, that doesn't work. They can kind of read it. Apache Daemon is here and it's running under Apache D type. So that's what we want. Then audit to allow. This will read the audit logs and see what was in them and what the problems were. And these are the rules that would allow things. You need to be really, really careful with this tool. It will just allow everything in the logs, which is not what you want. This rule, really bad. Like, things should not have access to shadow. Uh, it actually won't compile if you try that one. There's extra protections around that type to stop people doing things wrong. Um, the this is the actual audit log. So then if we go to the little web server that's running here, I put a backdoor, or let me show it first. So it's a very simple PHP uh, shell. If you get hacked by somebody, they will upload something like this so they can run more commands on your system. And it's, you, from here you can do a lot more things, read files, write files, whatever. So assuming we've been hacked already in this VM, we'll try some things first with enforcing mode and they won't work. And then we'll turn, them, turn enforcing mode off and then we'll try them again and then it's a lot worse. So you can ls the files because the web server is allowed to ls. You see that? I can it. So you can ls something. You can, uh, if you cat this file in proc, you see your own current type. So the backdoor script is running as the HTTP daemon. So that's mostly fine, not so bad. Now if you start ls root, you're not going to get anything. Not allowed. Okay, and for extra fun, I made my shadow file world readable. So anybody on the system, even if you're not root, can read it. Uh, don't ever do that. But so if SLinks was not around, that would be really bad and let you read all your passwords and then you're owned. So if we cat this, we again get nothing, which is what you want. So like, if this had happened, somebody would have broken into your machines and it, they would have had like the ability to do a little bit of stuff, but not very much. And if you lock things down, the web server can connect to the database and read its HTML files. And that's kind of bad because your database sucks, but like it's still just the database, not everything else. So that's a good start. If we had turned this off, I'm going to run this sinful command. And then if we check current mode now permissive, now we can try a lot more things. We can cap this file. You get the password's ASDF, so you don't have to crack it. Uh, but if this was an actual machine, you don't want like you don't want people getting that. Uh, what other fun things are there in a machine? Slash slash. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, well, I can. So you can read all this. You can. I don't know if this will work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, HDBD can't do it. Yeah. Why can't it? That sucks. Oh wait, it's under user SP. No. The web server doesn't have that much power. I'm just curious. Oh, it no, I ran it from here. I ran it here. So the actual state now is enforcing. But because the web server does not have access to even read what state SLinks is in, it thinks it's disabled. That's kind of cool, actually. I didn't know that. Um, so <coughs> yeah. Any other fun things you want to find out about? Oh, well, over here, we'll go through SE manage. So these are all the booleans. There's a lot of them for a lot of things. So if you don't use NFS, for example, you could have that turned off, and then it wouldn't allow any NFS access, which mm, if you do use it, then it's very easy to enable these extra permissions, which you want. And again, SC Linux is deny everything by default and only allow things that you like you by default nothing's allowed and then you, you have to allow certain things there is no deny rule so by default the idea is to keep things very slim and only the bare minimum is required so you can extend it if needed um, <laughs> I tried to do <coughs> Oh, also, I did this. So even without the shell, I put a symbolink to Etsy Shadow. So if you try that, that also won't work. So that is both, like somehow if you couldn't put an entire shell in, but you could somehow set a symlink to Etsy Shadow or read that, like it won't follow the symlink and it won't read the file. So you're kind of out of luck that way too. Um, the audit log, what is it doing at this point? Oh, yeah. Badness. So, this is the bad one that you don't want. These are the home directory accessing ones. This is the Boolean. See, it'll tell you if you want to allow this thing, set the Boolean. So if we set this thing, set it on, now we can do things in here. Hello world. That works. Very small. But, yeah. So, uh, how many people are going to enable it now? Did I convince anyone? <laughs> <laughs> um, as long as people are a bit less scared of it now than before, maybe you'll think twice about running Send for Zero. Why would someone disable it? 
Yeah, you, usually what happens is you just want your thing to work and... It's a hassle to manage. Used to be. Most, most of the guys from like Oracle, Database, uh, their guide is... Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so, so, like... It's a really, really, really bad sign if you're web, if you're like a big company, Oracle. We're supposed to like keep all your data safe, and like the first thing they tell you to do is turn it off. If you saw a product and this product said, "Oh, to use this one, you got to totally disable all your firewalls on your network," would you run that thing? Like that's really bad. If someone really doesn't want to run a firewall on your network, you wouldn't let them. SC Linux is pretty much a firewall between things on your computer. If people are telling you to turn it off, that's really bad sign. Like any projects out there that do that, you should hassle them for it. Not even if you don't really use it yourself. Like that's just really bad design choices and everything on their part. Like it's probably not something you want. So yeah, so people usually disable it because it breaks things. But like, if it's something in the distro already, it'll almost always work out of the box. And if it doesn't, because you move things around, it's hopefully just a matter of enabling some Booleans or changing some paths. If it's really something brand new, you could write the policy yourself or just file a bug with your distro <laughs> and they'll help. Uh, Red Hat has a whole ton. Yeah. Or, is it available in certain containers and like Docker? Does it have a CD like Um. So. SCLinux, there's only one in the kernel. There is a lot of work going on to allow like, it to run inside another one, but that doesn't work right now. It may work in a few months or something, hopefully. But right now, what happens is you put everything in like one Docker container running under like a Docker type. And then it's using multi-category security, which I covered earlier very briefly, to give each oh. container a separate like category. So Docker runs with kind of root access, right? Like containers? Yes. But it when it so uh, Docker is like well Dan, the guy who runs it at Red Hat, now works on Docker a lot. So he obviously put a lot of really good SLinux stuff into <coughs> Docker. So if you run a container, it will run it on its own. And also this VM that I'm running here. Uh, in libvirt. Libvirt is also hooked into SC Linux. So whenever I, so I have three different VMs. It's the same thing as Docker. It'll run each VM separately. So if somehow I manage to escape out of one of the Docker containers, I wouldn't be able to access anything outside the container. I wouldn't be able to access anything in any of the other containers either. So it's, um, but within the container, there is no SC Linux. Like it looks like there is none. Um, and everything runs as the same types, and hopefully in a while that'll like you'll be able to have a nested policy, but that doesn't work right now. Um, all, right, yeah. all right, go ahead. Uh, this this GRSec good project. How is it? Uh, GRSec is not um, not related. GRSec is a kernel patch set, mm -hmm. which enables a lot of other. Um, security hardening features, mm -hmm. uh, some extra permissions on read, write, and execute memory. So like you can't, like stack overflows and stuff don't work very well on it. And it has a lot of great stuff in it. But it's not, like it has nothing to do with SLinux. I run both on my laptop and all my machines. But you can run SLinux without GRSec. You can run GRSec without SLinux. And you can also, um, GRSec also has its own Mac in it, like their RBAC, which does a lot of the same things. Like it's the same idea, it's a Mac as well as SC Linux, but it's a different policy language. You set it up differently. I haven't actually used it, but uh, yeah. You had more, yeah. Uh, you said that everything is a label. Yeah. So I think the, those, when in terms of some server, service, HTTP. Yeah. Uh, those labels are they stored in the operating system in Linux itself, or is it stored somewhere? 
Um, okay, well, so if we look in, this is my uh, strict is the policy type right now. So then there's policy, and this policy.30 file is the whole actual policy. So when you boot the machine very, very, very early on, init will load that file into the kernel. Um, and that sets up everything in the kernel. So before that's loaded, you don't really have anything, but it's set super early. Um, if you look in contexts and then files, you get these file contexts, file context home dears. These are the files which, so let's do. If you look at this, these are all the labels on your entire machine. Like, there's a lot of them. You might not have all these things, but like, there's a lot of extra ones just to cover every base. And they don't really hurt. Like, they're um, pretty. And, and let's say when I install the HTTP server, hmm. and does it, then the, in those files, there will be some entries inserted. Oh, OK, yeah, so. What I'm, what, what I'm trying to ask is, uh, why doesn't the software provider, in this case, the uh, Apache service, for example, why doesn't it deliver the default uh, <coughs> CLNAX configuration? Because everybody complains about the uh, yeah, it breaks everything. Uh, so generally, so you the can't. The documentation is very missing, or the, they, the architects of this perspective software didn't think of that. Well, okay, honestly, a lot of people that like write web servers and things don't really care. <laughs> They're not going to write them. <laughs> so it's up to us to write them. And um, sometimes they do ship them. And sometimes they ship them as kind of an example. But generally, what the best is um, the HTTP daemon doesn't have permission to do anything with the policy. Like, it's a very low privileged thing which cannot touch any security stuff. So it can't load things at once. Like, that's not allowed at all. Otherwise, it could subvert all of it. So when you install like Apache on my machine, it'll also load the Gen2 has them quite modular. So it'll have like the HTTP policy separate. And it'll, load, it'll install that first. Then it'll install Apache. And the package manager, when it actually installs, it'll get things ready. And then it will label all the files in the package properly as it merges them in. RPM does the same. Like, They handle it kind of for you. Uh, you like Red Hat and Gentoo's policy, Ubuntu's policy, they're all like derived from the same reference policy project. So if you want to add support for whatever your software is, the best is to add support to the reference policy. And then from there, like, if you make something you add it to reference policy. I can pull it down to Gentoo really easily, and Fedora can pull it down to Fedora really easily. It's much better to do it that way. Then it's in the system, will get loaded when it gets loaded. Uh, Fedora, I think, loads all the policies, no matter what. So when you update it, there's a huge SLinux policy package which loads all of it. And it would pull in your policies, too, as needed. I have seen some packages once in a while, they'll try and load their own policy, and it doesn't work because they write them for Fedora. And there are slight differences, not huge, but like it's enough that like the one they wrote on Fedora won't work on any other distro. So generally, you don't want to do that. The best is to do it upstream in the reference, and then it'll get put everywhere else. Yeah, because it's in Fedora, like Fedora infrastructure, we have a lot of web applications which gets deployed mostly on Apache. But there, we also in the documentation, we clearly mention like which a uh, SLNX boolean you have to turn on to connect to database because that's where most people fail because they think it's just the standard Apache configuration. But obviously, that Apache cannot connect to your database. <laughs> yeah, that that's a really good. Yeah. So if you are shipping a package, you might want a lot of documentation saying, oh you need to enable these booleans, or you might need to set these things to remind the users. But you don't want to actually ship the actual like policy file, because that's probably not so good. But documentation like that is always very helpful. As long as your documentation does not say turn it off, that's not cool. <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, almost most of the web applications we have in the infrastructure, I mean, that one thing is common in everywhere. In this index that okay, remember to enable, if you connect to database, remember to enable that on that server. Otherwise, you can't. <laughs> And also, so if you have a rule like don't ever turn it off, things will always work on it. Otherwise, you have a problem where like, oh, it doesn't work. Let me turn it off now. And then it works, kind of. And then you forget and go home. And then later, you reboot the server. And when it reboots again, it turns it on. And then all your stuff broken. And you have no idea why. So if you just don't turn it off, it works a lot. <laughs> like, and don't start playing with them Friday night kind of thing. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, let me go back to this. There's a lot more documentation on everything else. Uh, I didn't cover network types, but like there's a lot of, every part of the system has an SE Linux thing with it. Also Apache, as a user space thing, can query the, if you install like mod SE Linux into Apache, it can query SE Linux for some other things. And then you can set things up where if, for example, you were a hosting provider that provided hosting to many customers on the same machine, you can have each customer's um, like web app running under its own types. And Apache will do that for you. So you can do a lot more with it, much, much more than I explained today. Uh, the wikis are really good. The project wiki has every like documentation on every single rule. There are quite mm -hmm. a lot. Most of them you don't really need very often. The main ones allow, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there something along the lines of like a BIM tutor to make it interactive and go through the steps or? The coloring book. Coloring book is the best. Uh, yeah, I would. Well, the color was pretty simple. It's like four pages. Um, and then really, it's more a pattern, like try and turn it on, or at least turn it into permissive mode first, and then look at the audit logs and see what's really broken. And the audit tool allows a separate package we need to do. Uh, it's part of the core utils. Oh, okay. So like, if you have it, it'll be there. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so, there are a thing called permissive types. So if for some reason you really, really like, your web servers really need this access to something and you can't do the policy, you can turn just one type into permissive, which is much better than setting the whole system, which means that type will be exempt from everything, which is pretty bad if it's a web server. But if you need it for something like, oh, my backups really aren't working and I really need my backups to work now, like you can do that a bit. So. That is all handled with SE Manage as well. Uh, oh, okay, well, let's show. So if you look through the SE Manage ports, this is the Apache port, 80, 443, 8080. So those are the ones you're allowed to bind on. If you would need to bind Apache on something else, SE manages where to go. Almost everything you need to configure, you can do with SE manage. You shouldn't really need to start diving into the policies, but um, yeah. Uh, and I'll upload the slides on my blog, like after this. Cool. Nothing else. I think that's it. Awesome. You should all do this. <laughs>